Coach Gary Close is back, folks. Yet another year of Iowa post game with Coach Gary Close, former Iowa men's basketball assistant coach Gary Close, right here from the Hawkeye of the Storm all season long for Iowa hoops. But first, it's time for our preseason special, a sit down with Coach Close as we take a look at the season ahead, including the Iowa Hawkeye men's basketball roster, the schedule, and what he thinks of competition this year in the Big Ten Conference. All that and more during our 2022-2023 men's basketball season preview show right here during week 204 of Brad is Branded Thoughts. This is from the Hawkeye of the Storm. You may have heard of the real-life Hawkeye Man Cave known as Kinnick Under the Kitchen. Well, after lots of hard work, there's not much space left to paint, but the walls are exploding out for public consumption. Under the Kitchen is proud to announce that you can now purchase exclusive prints of some of your favorite Hawkeye legends, including wrestling great Spencer Lee, football players Arlen Bruce, Riley Moss, and Tavian Banks, plus an all-in-one Murray family legacy print featuring Keegan, Chris, and Kenyon Murray himself. Signed and unsigned prints are available, making the perfect collectible or gift for any Hawkeye enthusiast. For more information on purchasing one of these outstanding Hawkeye prints, visit Under the Kitchen on Facebook. That's Under the Kitchen on Facebook. Pleased to be joined now by the one and only Coach Gary Close back for <laughs> another season here on the show. And Gary, it's been a while since uh, we've seen you. I said as you you jumped on the broadcast before we went live here, I said uh, you're a, kind of a sight for sore eyes. I've missed talking basketball with you and lots happened with Iowa basketball as it relates to uh, recruiting and certainly with coaching changes. So before we get to substance, appreciate you coming back. And how's your uh, summer and fall been going? It's been great. It's gone by fast, like probably a lot of people will, will tell you, but um, uh, it's been a lot of fun. And and uh, this is always a fun time of year, too. The basketball season is right around the corner and you got baseball playoffs, football started. So it's uh, not a bad time. Well, how is it different now? I mean, you look back at your your coaching years, most of your life. Right. I mean, this is this is probably one of the busiest times of the year. And of course, now you're you're still excited for this time of the year, but it's got to feel different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you're you're always eagerly anticipating the start of the year and and get go back going again. And there's a lot of teaching going on, which as a coach is is always fun to do, putting a team together and seeing how people have improved. And and uh, you know, back in the day when you were you weren't even able to have any contact with them all summer long, you really didn't know. Now you get you got you get a little bit of contact, so you're watching them develop a little bit. But uh, putting a team together is is a lot of fun. And, um, you, you know, you're starting a long journey and the teams that improve the most, uh, usually the ones that are the most successful. Well, we've had an interesting off season, Gary, as it relates to Iowa basketball. Um, last time we were on the air together live, we had, uh, Matt Gatons, who was an assistant coach uh, at Drake. And we were recapping what was a very disappointing Iowa exit in the, in the NCAA tournament. And a lot of kind of shell shocked Iowa fans, and I, you kind of understand why. Looking back, uh, what a what a finish to the season as it relates to the regular season, and then the Big Ten tournament run, a tournament that Iowa had struggled to play in for a number of years, and uh, you play a Richmond team that goes on to lose handily to Providence. I, I know we're kind of looking back, but what do you take from that exit? Is that more? Do you just kind of look back and say that's just how the NCAA tournament works, or is there other things you can learn from? so that uh, there is a better chance at, at tournament success this coming spring? Yeah, that's that's a, that's a good question. Um, it, it certainly is the nature of the NCAA tournament. I mean, you, you, it's not like it's a five-game series or a seven-game series where usually, the, especially in basketball, usually the better team will prevail. It's a, it's a one-shot deal, and you just have an off night. Uh, you can be bounced, and I think that's the, the primary reason. Just did, They just didn't have – their, their, their best game and you know, it came in a pretty d- tough time. So um, I'm sure it left a, a bad feeling and hopefully it's something that will motivate them. Uh, but uh, uh, so much emphasis is put on the tournament that when you don't do well, it, it kind of leaves a sour feeling on what was a really, really successful year uh, in terms of what they lost, what was coming back, the competitiveness in the league to win the Big Ten tournament championship. There were a lot of positives that uh, made it a really, really fun year to to watch the Hawkeyes. 
Connor McCaffrey, I know he's went on the record in some interviews since that loss and has been very outspoken about how that loss still haunts him. And other, there have been other people who have other players, and I've asked these players the same question. Uh, do you feel the same way as Connor? And they said, no, I've, I've flushed it. So from your experience in coaching, is that a good or a bad thing, or does it just depend on the individual as it relates to, okay, I'm going to use this loss from nine months ago as motivation, or I flushed it the day after? How do you uh, – how would you interpret that? Yeah, I think it's a, a, your own personal take. You know, Connor, his his career is winding down, and so he doesn't have as many opportunities to go after this as some of the others. Maybe if you ask them in another year or two, they'd feel the exact same way that uh, you only get you know you only get that chance, and once that chance is over, it's done. And uh, when those chances are over, uh, then there's no looking back. So um, I, I think um, in his case. You know, they had a really good team. They had a chance to really make a run. They were coming off a terrific uh, Big Ten tournament. There, I, I know there was probably a lot of disappointment. They couldn't have, couldn't have made a deep run in the NCAA tournament. And and uh, so I can see where he's coming from. With other people, um, he, you know, they, they'd rather move on and 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 not dwell on it. And it's, it's kind of a perspective from from each individual. And Gary, I don't know how you feel about this. I know it's just completely. Um, circumventing, if you will. But, I mean, I, I think that you get past Richmond in that game. I know Providence won handily over Richmond, but I think Iowa matched up okay with Providence. Th there was a chance for them to make a run. I mean, a serious run. I don't think there's a – you know, I, I think there's this misconception that, you know, you lose in the first round, that you were a, fr a fake or a fraud. But yeah. as you alluded to earlier, matchups are huge. I mean, how, how far could Iowa have went in the tournament, and how much does that motivate you moving forward? Uh, heading into March Madness in 20. Yeah, that's a good question. You know, it's uh, that first game is always a bear. I mean, it's just uh, it's, it's the first time, even in the Big Ten tournament, uh, you lose. You know, you still got, you know, unless you're one of the teams at the, near, near the bottom part of the standings where you're not going to get the NCAA. In Iowa's case, they knew they had another game, uh, even if they lost in the Big Ten tournament. When you get the NCAA, it's over, and it's a little different right. animal. Um, and so a lot of times you get through that first game. I even know in some of our runs at Wisconsin late, um, my stint there, we had two really difficult games in our final four years in our first game <laughs> and could have gotten knocked out in either one of them and survived. And then you kind of get, okay, we got that one by, we, you know, let's, let's get it going here. And, and, uh, so a lot of times just get, get, get through that first one. You know what they say, just, you know, survive in advance. That's, that's, that's the case. You just got to find a way to, to win and, and then keep doing that. Cause it's just a one, it's a one day tournament deal, um, in terms of winning and losing. So, um, uh, I like to think, um, you know, they got a lot of guys back from that team and they got the experience and, and, um, hopefully that's one of the factors that motivated them for a big, strong off season. And the irony behind having Matt Gatons on for our last show is that just months later, now he is a part of the staff with Kirk Spira and uh, Billy Taylor moving on. Of course, Courtney Eldridge promoted to one of the full time, the three full time assistant roles. I know that you don't know Courtney as well as you know Matt, and of course, uh, these guys are are we're evaluating these guys as coaches. But knowing what you know about Matt Gatons, what does he bring to this staff um, in, in replacement of, of two? I mean, honestly, both of these guys, Courtney and Matt, are young in, in place of two very um, seasoned veterans in Spurron. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, well, I've known Matt for a long, long time from when I first got to Iowa and as a little kid, and then you know, watching his career at Iowa, and he uh, he had he had a hand in a couple of knots on my head, um, and um, and then you know, seeing his you know, his coach career develops. So it, it's a, it's a great hire. I mean, he's, he's a Hawkeye. He's student of the game, uh, loves the game of basketball. I, I think he's got a great personality. I think he'll get along well with, with the team. So I, I thought it was a no brainer uh, hire. Um, he's replacing a real good coach in Kirk Sprawl. He, he's a veteran. He's um, terrific in, you know, scouting reports and things like that. So it's, um it'll be interesting to watch because those two, Guys are very experienced and been down the pike, and and now you got two young guys. It's it's it'll be a little different, but it'll probably bring a you know a, a different vibe, which is sometimes is great. Is it's you know it's just, you know in case it might be just what they need. Uh, so um, I think the world of Matt. I think he'll do a great job. Courtney, I don't know as as well, uh, but I've heard real good things about him. So 
uh, I think uh, I think Fran did a good job in replacing two really good um, experienced coaches. We've talked about different roles for for different assistant coaches on staffs, um, and I remember asking you, did you focus more on big men, on guards, on? And I don't believe you really. That was kind of that wasn't how Dr. Tom operated here, correct? Yeah, actually, both places. Uh, not really. It's just we should kind of all taught and had our little niche and, and uh, we all divided up the scouting and, and the recruiting. And so it was more of a team effort rather than, a, you know, an offensive coach and defensive coach, but that's, you know, that's changed uh, more. I think more and more teams are doing that. Um, I'm not sure Iowa does that, but I, I know in our the two places I work at, we, we didn't do that. And so uh, in addition to the, the coaching changes throughout the off season, um, we know NIL and transfer portal, have been major storylines, not just at Iowa, but across the landscape of, of college basketball and college football, for that matter. Um, Iowa, and to no one's surprise, made an effort in the portal, um, especially at the five. Uh, Fardaz Amac being a kid that uh, it looked for a while like Iowa had a, a decent shot at. Um, he ends up going to uh, Texas Tech. Um, they went after, I mean, they went after a number of guys in the portal at that position. Um, Fran swings and misses. And I think NIL, I don't want to say you blame everything on NIL, but that's certainly a factor. What just your general thoughts, Gary, we can talk about big man in a second, but your general thoughts on the changing landscape, because the last time we've talked, I mean, back in the spring, it was, it just seems like the world has changed a lot in the last six, seven months as it relates to these two. Yeah. Things. Yeah. I, it's got me a little concerned. I, I, it'll be interesting to see how it all transpires. I mean, it, it was long overdue that, that uh, in my opinion, that athletes needed to get some compensation. It just, uh, you know, it was the, the, the money that was being made uh, wasn't, you know, wasn't tricking down to them. Uh, and, and and they need, they need some spending money. They can't work, you know, things like that. Um, the transfer portal scares me. I just, uh, I don't like the idea that people can uh, transfer within the league and they're, they're immediately eligible and, uh, so basically what, it, you know, it's, it's a, it's a crapshoot. They can just get up and go and not a whole lot you can do about it. So roster management is, is, is a big part of what's going on now. Uh, and the transfer portal is a huge part of recruiting. And um, I think, you know, that's obviously probably here to stay and maybe there'll be some tweaks, but um, as a coach, I, um, there are parts of it that I don't, that I don't like. If you were coaching right now, um, can you imagine coaching right now? I mean, with with this change in scenery. Well, you you know it's there, so you got to deal with. It. It's like a lot of things yeah. that you, you can complain about all you want, but you know you got to understand it and use it to the best of your ability. Um, but it, yeah, it'd be a challenge. I don't think there's any question. It's uh, you know your ability to manage your roster and make sure you got everything covered when people coming and going and uh, it's, it's a, it's a big part of college basketball and college football that, you know, obviously wasn't there not that long ago. Hey, I promise we're going to talk about big men in a second, but I do want to get your thoughts briefly on recruiting. I know you're not uh, on the recruiting trail or working for some recruiting service, Gary, but, uh, <laughs> since we, when, since we talked last, uh, Brock Harding added to the class, a uh, quad cities kid. And then of course, price Sanford, the uh, brother of, of Peyton. And uh, one other in 2024, you know who I'm talking about, Cooper Koch, now added yeah. to the class. Um, but just your overall thoughts about Iowa's recruiting momentum. I, I still like the the two classes that, that Fran is forming here for the, the two years ahead. I still think they need a bit – I think maybe athleticism um, is a concern, at least from my vantage point, especially on the defensive end. But you're, just your thoughts on on where the class is headed right now. Sounds like – I, you know, I have not seen any of the kids play um... – read a little bit about them, but it sounds like they're really excited about both. Um, I think the other thing that hits me is realize how old I'm getting when, when I got former players that I coach as kids now coming, coming and playing for the Hawkeyes. Now this is another one with uh, Cooper Koch. who's a real good player. That's a, that's a, that's a good get. So uh, sounds like that's going well. Um, I like, I like Peyton a lot. So his brothers, brothers like him, that's, that's a, that's a step in the right direction. So, and you want to keep, Obviously, you want to try to keep the the uh, good players in state at home uh, with your program. So, looks like they've done a nice job. And for the record, anybody, I mean, we're getting recruiting services. If you want to read into those, you, you certainly can. But 
Bryce is considered at high school to be the, the better of the two prospects. Uh, now, Peyton, is, I mean, clearly has an opportunity to emerge this year. But for the record, this is not uh, the result of uh, just purely the result of Iowa having uh, added Peyton already. This is a, a yeah. high level prospect in Price yeah. for it. So, well, same thing with Cooper. He had a, he had uh, he had about every Big Ten school after him, um, and, and he would have had more had he waited. Oh more. yeah, no, no doubt. So um, it's nice to be able to lock those lock those players up, and you can start working on classes down the road. Uh, so hats off to him. I mentioned Iowa swinging and missing in the portal. They didn't completely swing and miss, I guess, if you want to count Josh Agundale entering the portal and then leaving the portal, which surprised me at the time. I thought he was gone, gone, gone. But um, just your thoughts on Josh coming back and how does he move forward? How does he press forward to actually uh, – it doesn't sound like he's going to start out of the gates, but, boy, with his size, he can give them something that uh, they haven't had in quite some time. How does Josh take that next step? Well, that's what's going to be interesting to see. You know, we don't we don't know. We haven't seen how hard he's worked in the off season. Um, you know, is he in better shape? Is he added? He's, has he added skill to his skill set? Uh, that's the beauty of college basketball. Is is uh, I mean, I can think of I can think of Kevin Gamble, our first year at Iowa. He never played the year prior. Hardly played. I think he averaged two points a game. And by the end of the year, by the end of the year, he was one of the, one of our best players on the team. And that first the team we had. So um, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but it's it's uh, you know as you get older, things seem to change a little bit. Maybe you get a, you know you're 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 seeing the end of the road is coming, and and maybe that'll inspire you to work a little bit harder. And and so there there's something there. It's just a question of whether he can make the commitment to be in great shape. Uh, like we said, to add add things to his game so that he can get himself onto the floor. I think that's his first goal is to get minutes. He hasn't been able to do that. And I think he's got a challenge because I think the guys that are back that have played um, have proven something. Certainly Phillip has. Um, Riley is probably in the same boat as he is. But um, he, he's going to have to he's going to have to do some things or he won't get on the court because he's got some competition there. Were you surprised at all to to see Fran bring him back when a guy enters the portal? I mean, I know the portal's sort of new, and and you've been out of the game here for a few years, but is is that uh, surprising to see uh, a coach take a player back when when the player enters the portal? Well, I think you know, I think it, he decided to take a look to see what was out there, and what was out there wasn't uh, obviously wasn't as good as what he had back at Iowa, and Iowa's probably doing the exact same thing, and and uh, because now there's a spot open. And I'm guessing if they'd gotten one of the guys that you were talking about, then he wouldn't have come back. So, uh, you know, the chips just fell where they were, that it all worked out. And they know him. He knows the program. So there's less teaching as far as that goes in terms of what they do and what they expect. So um, I think it's kind of thing, hey, there's there's no risk and maybe there'll be a reward. If not, then they're going to have to go to somebody else. And I'll say this, Gary, and you can provide your thoughts. I, I think, and I said this at the end of last year, if either Riley or Josh can take that next step and emerge as even 15 to 20 minute guys a game, I think this team can be really good. I think they're good as is with Phillip logging most of the minutes at the five. But I tell you, if you can get a seven footer in there who provides physicality and, and rim protection and a little bit of scoring, I don't think you need a ton of scoring. Yeah, um, I, I think this team can be really good. Just your thoughts. Well, depth is always nice to have. I mean, you, you have injuries, you have foul trouble. Uh, maybe guys aren't playing as well as on that given night that they normally do. So the more, the more, and then competition is great. You know, you, it, competition brings out the best in everybody. So the more competition, the more depth you got, it just, it gives you more options. You can, uh, you know, you can survive injuries better. So yeah, it'd be great if, uh, if somebody could take a big jump, and in some cases they may take a big jump and get themselves in the starting lineup. It's it's that's that's the fun part of it to see if anybody can pull that off. Um, but I think Philip will be hard to dislodge from that spot. He he got better as the year went on, and uh, I, I, I'd be shocked if he didn't have a good off season. And uh, so he's it's going to take somebody to play real well, I think, to knock him out of there. 
Hawkeye fans, let's talk about health and performance optimization for a moment. Our sponsor, Ascent Nutrition, offers amazing products. It's actually owned by former Iowa graduate Lance Shuttler. Now, I've decided to partner with Ascent Nutrition because of their unique approach to human health. Ascent offers an organically grown mold and mycotoxin-free coffee. It provides a pure, clean, and rich flavor without those pesticides that most coffees are treated with. They also offer an algae oil DHA, which is used to support brain health, memory, and focus, as well as proper nervous system development in adults, children, athletes, and even pets. Now, lastly, their unique crafted wild pine pollen is used to support cardiovascular health, hormonal function, and a healthy libido. Your purchase not only supports this channel, but the business of a former Hawkeye. Visit GoAscentNutrition.com or click the link in the description below and use the code Hawkeyes. That's the code Hawkeyes to receive 15% off your total order from Ascent Nutrition. One thing about Iowa, Gary, is uh, they do lack... Uh, unless Josh or Riley can emerge, they do lack a, a solid presence bigger than than six nine in Philip Perbracha. However, they're really long across the board. I mean, even Tony Perkins, who I you know consider to be the starting two at this point, is a long two. Um, and of course, we, with Patrick McCaffrey and Chris Murray and even Peyton Sanford, who reportedly has grown a full inch during this past off season, which. I want to get your thoughts on that in a second, but um, how much does that length help you um, across the board, even may, though you may not have that uh, that seven footer who's proven? Yeah, yeah, I I don't think that'll be a problem. I think um, I think the way Philip play going down a stretch, and like you mentioned, the other they you know they've got they've got some length and size at the other positions, and um, so it might be it actually it might give them some chance to do some things defensively. Maybe they can't do with, with a seven footer in there, so. Um, you know, good coaches and Franz Juan, he, he, he'll, you know, he, here's what I've got. And this is, this is what we've got to do to give us our best chance of winning. And so, um, it'd be great to have some additional depth that we talked about and you bring a seven footer off there to give you a different look. Um, but if that isn't the case, I still think they're fine. Let's take a look at the starting five. This is just my prediction, I guess, if you will, Euless Perkins, Patrick McCaffrey, Chris Murray, and Rebracha. I think that's pretty much what we're going to see. Um, do you see any flexibility there? I mean, maybe DeSante Bowen emerges as a true freshman, but boy, I think it'd be hard to dislodge a guy who's going into his junior season in Tyler and uh, Aaron Euless, excuse me. Um, just your, start, your thoughts on the starting five. I think that's a pretty good guess. Yeah, I mean, that, that's your most experienced team. Um, the, uh, so I, I would say that's probably a good good spot to start. Um, I think both Sanford and, and Connor will get real significant minutes and could start uh, depending on how some of those guys pan out. But um, I think that's probably a pretty good guess going into going into the year. I don't know how much you know about Josh Dix, but he's an intriguing prospect at Council Bluffs who, of course, broke his leg, had a, a brutal leg injury yeah. when that happened. And we were on the air talking about that news. But, boy, he seems to be, by all accounts – back up to full speed um so if there, if there aren't any uh any, aren't any relegations about him logging heavy minutes I, I would assume that he could mix into the rotation from day one and he brings shooting and and uh, a presence on the wing um and of course Desante Bowen his athleticism he's a scoring mm -hmm. point guard mm -hmm. uh, that that has been a question I have with this starting five do I think Tony Perkins is going to take a step forward? I, I, I sure hope so as it relates to scoring and, and shooting. But with, with losing Jordan Bohannon, you do take a hit as it relates to scoring and especially shooting prowess. If you're, you're one and two is Euless and Perkins, those two guys have struggled at times from three. Um, your thoughts on the backcourt at this point, Gary? Well, it's like, it's like anything what we've talked about, you know, hopefully they put the work in and, and they will be better shooters. Um, if not, I think, as you mentioned, I think they got some guys on the bench that are proven shooters that, um, if they need that, that in the lineup, uh, they can, they can go to that. So, um, you know, a lot of times we, we compartmentalize kids based on what they've done in the past and we don't consider what, what could happen in the future and what, you know, what, what they've added to their games. And so we'll have to wait and see. I think both showed, um, flashes of being real good players and 
Uh, hopefully, uh, over the summer they've 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 improved and added some things to their game, and and uh, um, will be a real good, strong uh, backcourt. Be remiss if we didn't bring up the the loss of Keegan Murray and the loss of uh, Joe Toussaint because the two, those two guys were heavy parts of the rotation. Keegan um, goes without saying, and what he's doing so far with Sacramento, we'll see once we hit the regular season what he does. But um, those are some heavy losses to uh, to replace. Um, does no Iowa does, does Iowa go deeper this year, Gary, because of some of the lack of experience and mix more guys in? Um, do they shorten the rotation? How do you see Fran playing this out? Yeah, that's a real good question. I think a lot of it will depend upon, you know, what's 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 out there in terms of how they're playing and how they're developing. And I think Fran would like to have a deep bench that most coaches do um, uh, have different options. And like we said, people get hurt, people get in foul trouble, people aren't playing well. It gives you just a different look. Um, but you got to you got to go with what can get you get you W's. And so. That could even change during the course of the year uh, as, as, as young kids emerge or injuries happen. So um, those losses are significant. But um, the good news is that a lot of teams in the league have gone through the same thing. There's, a, there's been a lot of turnover uh, with really good players. We saw it in the NBA draft. It was one of the best NBA drafts for the Big Ten in a long time. Some real good players went very high in the draft. So Iowa wasn't the only one that lost some real special players. So um, – it's going to make for an interesting Big Ten season because there's a lot of unknowns out there that um, uh, that we don't know about as as we go into this uh, season coming fast. And uh, I, I I didn't write this down to to bring up to you, Gary, but uh, just provide your thoughts on Keegan. I mean, what uh, again? We haven't been on the air since he was drafted uh, in the top five, and now you know w- was probably the best player in in summer league. Um, at least the best rookie in summer league. Um, and now I think has a, a good shot. I've been following preseason action too much, but uh, has a good shot at, at potentially being a starter from day one. Mm-hmm. Boy, that's tough to yeah. do as a rookie. Yeah, no, that's, that's impressive. Um, and we just kind of saw it all year long. He just kept getting better and better and uh, adding things to his game and, and um, uh, just, just taking off. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a fun thing to watch. I know we talked about it. enjoy it because it's not going to last forever. And, and uh, you just, you just tip your hat off to them. The hard work is paid off. There's nothing better than seeing kids rewarded for their hard work and dedication. And uh, he's a player. There's no, there's no question about it. he'll, I'd be shocked if he's not in the running for rookie of the year. I think he's, I think he's that good. And certainly, um, you know, you look at uh, the Big Ten. Uh, I want to cover that before we kind of get into final thoughts on Iowa's schedule and just the outlook. Um, Indiana appears to be the uh, preseason favorites to win the conference. I think that's a bit premature, not saying that they shouldn't be top two or three, but perhaps uh, overestimating uh, Indiana's returning talent. I mean, I understand Trace Jackson Davis finished the the season strong. He's kind of been up and down throughout his career. There's a reason he came back and he wasn't ready for the NBA draft, not trying to discount anything he can do at the college level, but uh, he's a guy who's limited because of his lack of jump shot. Uh, I know Xavier Johnson came on strong late in the year, but your thoughts on the Hoosiers and is there someone else that you would peg as maybe a preseason favorite? You know, I, I don't know if I've ever gone into a Big Ten season with very little <laughs> confidence on who to pick. Yeah, uh, I agree. So many teams have lost so many players that were really important players. I and mean, when Wisconsin lost Davis and Davidson, I mean, those are two really good players. And Purdue lost good players. Uh, I mean, just right down the list. Um, and so I, I think it's I think it's up in the air. I, I you, you got to in all those polls, you got to pick somebody. Somebody's got to be picked number one. But I, I could see anybody, um, with maybe with exception of a few teams, that could have it. You know, depending on how their how their teams develop, how their young people develop, their transfer, whatever. Um, could emerge you could see a log jam like you did last year in terms of ties it's 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 wide open in my opinion and I really I've got no idea who I would who I would pick to be favored just because of, of the tremendous amount of turnover within the league so here here is you know, we'll just run through the uh, preseason selections by the media of course Indiana predicted as the uh, the favorites in the Big Ten Conference. Illinois, Michigan, Michigan State, Purdue, Ohio State, Iowa comes in at seventh, middle of the pack. Rutgers, I think, maybe a bit under-ranked. I know Andy Katz agrees with that. Wisconsin at nine, 
That scares me to see Wisconsin pick that low as well, Gary. You know all about that. And then Maryland, mm-hmm. Penn State, Minnesota, Northwestern, and Nebraska. And um, boy, lowly Nebraska there at 14 doesn't mean that they'll finish 14th. But uh, I brought to you, brought this up to you before we started recording as well. Um, I'm a big fan of Fred Hoiberg, even though um, he's a he's a cyclone at heart. Um, I have a bad feeling this might be his last year as it relates to having a chance to to turn that program around, just because of. I mean, look at the <laughs> look what Wisconsin just did in the, in the football field with the Paul, firing a Paul Christ in Nebraska with Scott Frost. Your thoughts on Hoiberg and what does he need to do to uh, make it through another season? Yeah, I, I feel the same way. Fred Hoiberg is is one of my all time favorites. I hated competing against him because he was a phenomenal player. Uh, he's from Iowa. He's he's terrific representative of the of the sport and college basketball and so I'm pulling for him I hope he can I hope he can pull it off he's got to win I mean that's that's pure and simple he's got he's got to get some wins and he's got to be competitive in the league and I think it shows you how tough and deep this league is it's hard to get wins um and uh, that's a classic example of it and he he could he could have a better team and still not move up enough or get enough wins to to save his job. So I hope he can pull it off. Um, it's going to be a challenge because um, there are a lot of uh, good basketball teams ahead of him right now, so to speak. And, and uh, he's got to jump a lot of teams to, to keep his job. So it'll be one thing that'll be interesting to watch. As far as the rest of the big 10 is concerned, Gary, um, is there any other dark horses? I mean, obviously Penn state's a year, an extra year in under Mike, Micah Shrewsbury, you've got uh, Ben Johnson up at Minnesota, mm-hmm. um, and uh, you know the change at Rutgers, or excuse me, a change at Maryland. Yeah, um, I saw the picture. I know I'm kind of jumping all over the place. Did you see the picture yesterday with with uh, Greg Gard and uh, Juan Howard sitting no, there with their, I mean, standing there with their arms across each other, smiling? No, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> no fist across. No fist across this time. Okay. I got a good kick out of. it. But is there anybody else in the Big Ten that? Uh, that you have on maybe dark horse alert. Well, I think it's uh, surprising that Wisconsin's picked ninth and they have two guys on the all, all league team. I, I think I, so. That too. kind of surprised me. Yeah. Um, so um, I think they're, they're, they're a potential dark horse. I think Michigan state with Tom Izzo, you always got to be wary of. They're just, you know, that's just, that's a proven commodity right there. Um, and the same thing you said for, for Matt Painter at, at uh, Purdue. And, and uh, so, but as we mentioned, it's 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 going to be really interesting to watch because I don't know if I've ever seen as much turn, turn, turnover in a league as we've seen this this past year with guys leaving early and guys graduating and transferring out. So and in, so it's going to be it's going to make for a very interesting year. Gary, Iowa received a first place vote from somebody. Did you have a vote? <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> myself that's somehow i got i hacked into the the database there and uh but no i i I do find it uh intriguing with the um as you you brought it up i mean just how wide open this conference appears to be um looking at the all big 10 preseason selections um first team loaded with big men hunter dickinson trace jackson davis uh cliff amori zach Eady, and then of course chris murray chris murray the smallest guy on there and he's like six eight six nine um, second team, though, you don't see as as many big men. In fact, you don't see any big men, which tells me that the league is not quite as deep at that position, which could help a team like Iowa that maybe lacks an inside presence. Terrence Shannon Jr., uh, the Texas Tech transfer, who's now with the Illini, Xavier Johnson, who came on strong with the Hoosiers late in the year, Chucky Hepburn from Wisconsin, Jamison Battle, the former transfer that's now a, a gopher, and uh, Tyler Wall, who I think has a chance to be a first-team All-Big Ten guy depending on how his year goes. Just your thoughts on uh, preseason selections from the media. Well, I think they, they're they skewed toward the mo- most experienced, most proven players, which which is what it should be. Uh, you know, they're, they're obviously not picking by position or the first team would be a little bit different. You got, As you said, you got all big guys in there. And all those guys have played a lot of basketball in the league, have proven to be real good, dependable Big Ten players. And it just shows you, as we mentioned, the turnover that's go- going on in the league. There's just a lot of question marks out there of, of – talented players that haven't had their chance for whatever reason now it's their time and I think the teams that can develop those young players quickly and continually will be the ones that'll be in the race uh to the end and, and so I think teaching and and getting uh 
individuals improve as well as your team is going to be really important this year because the lack of experience um, is pretty much the case all the way up and down the down the league. All right, let's finish off this discussion and this show, Gary, by talking specifics as it relates to the schedule. Um, this is an intriguing schedule. I know last last year um, I kind of gave Iowa a hard time for a weak non conference schedule, and uh, you you got after me a couple times for that. But I don't think we're going to be going back and forth. Well, on you're the a typical media guy that's, that's got to find something <laughs> yeah. wrong with. I'm not going to be it listen. Is. I'm not going to be complaining about the schedule this year. How about this no. for a non-conference slate? Duke, Seton Hall, Iowa State, Clemson, Georgia Tech, who's not great in the ACC, but T- and TCU, who's a really good Big 12 team, who should have beaten Arizona in the, in the NCAA tournament if it wasn't for horrendous uh, officiating by the Zebras or, or Cal, of course, there as well. Um, just your thoughts on the, the schedule makeup, um, and maybe specifically we can hit on the matchup in Madison Square Garden against the Blue Devils. Yeah, that's 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 a gauntlet. Um, he's going to know an awful lot about his team when he gets through all that. That's, um, but I applaud him. I, I think he, I think he realized that he's got a chance to have a really good, solid team and and to get prepared for the Big Ten. What you want to do in the non-conference is you want to find out what your weaknesses are. You don't want to find those out while the league's going on because then it might be too late. And so he'll have, like we mentioned, he'll have a good idea. Hey, we're we got to shore up this area. We got to get better here. Uh, this team exposed that, and and then hopefully they can, can get through it um, and gain some confidence and gain some knowledge, and then be set up for a run in the in the in the Big Ten. Um, so yeah, that's a that's quite a schedule. That's going to be um, it's going to be fun to watch. Maybe maybe not as much fun to coach, but um, we'll learn an awful lot about this Hawkeye team by the time they get through all that. And Gary, I know hindsight's twenty twenty. And I'm not saying that Iowa was seeded correctly last year. I know there was controversy from some that Iowa should have been a four seed. My argument there, and I'm not knocking Fran for the schedule. I understand why he he built the non-conference schedule last year the way he did. But if you have a slightly better non-conference schedule, you're probably a four seed. Are you not last year in the tournament? Possibly. Yep. I mean, that's that's certainly one of the areas of criteria they look at. So that won't be a problem this year. All right, Gary, am I missing anything? Is there, is there anything that uh, I didn't hit on that uh, that we should bring up? Um, I, I did mention as far as players in the Big Ten, I, I think Zed Key is a guy to, to look for that was not listed on either of the uh, either first team or, or second team all Big Ten. I hate going up against those big yeah. massive centers from Michigan State and, and Ohio State year after year. Is there anything else that I'm missing? I think I think you got it covered as always. Another A plus performance by you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, I just want to let everybody know that uh, as we announced here the other day, um, we'll be uh, returning with uh, Coach Close throughout the season. So, uh, second year of uh, Iowa post game with Coach Gary Close, and um, we'll have to uh, figure out a way to spice things up. I know uh, we've been uh, inter- integrating. Um, video calls from people, and it's, I know yeah. Don Patterson's had a good time with some of those. We've had a few intoxicated people call in uh, late in the, at night, so hopefully we get some early Uh-oh. tip-offs, Gary, and we can avoid yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's open form, so you never know what's going to happen. So we'll, we'll we'll deal with it. Yeah. All right, Coach. Well, we look. I, I know I look forward. I know the listeners and the watchers uh, look forward to uh, hearing your expertise all season long. So we look forward to uh, what should be a very exciting season. Um, exhibition, boy, do you realize there's an exhibition against Jeff Horner's team, Truman State, on the 31st of October? We're literally oh, days close. away. Oh, that's uh, yeah. And what else do they have? Is that the one? Um, it's the one exhibition they have. Yeah, I think they first they have a close scrimmage that, uh, right, we don't know about. First yeah, regular so. season game is uh, November 7th. November That'll be 7th. it before you know it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to it. It's, uh, there's nothing better, so we'll we'll have some fun with it. All right, folks. For Coach Gary Close, I'm Corey Braddock. Gary, appreciate it again, and we'll talk you to bet. you soon. Sounds good.